Tee up. It's time for the Blind Golf Canada podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blind Golf Canada podcast. You can tell already it's new, it's different. Your hosts have not changed. My name is Jerry Nelson. I'm president of Blind Golf Canada, blind golfer as well, and my fellow blind golfer and buddy, Mr. Darren Duma. Hi, Jerry. How's it going? Good, good. Good. Good to be back. Nice to be back in golf and back to our podcast. And It has been a long time coming, hasn't it? Way too long. Darren, Way too what long. are your positions with, uh, with Blind Golf and its associations in Canada? I'm uh, VP of Admin with Blind Golf Canada, as well as the President of the Western Canadian Blind Golf Association. So. Awesome. And I can attest to what you do for Blind Golf and its golfers in Canada each and every day throughout the year. So it's a pleasure to be back working with you, buddy. And you're here, here. Uh, the same. Very excited about our new relationship with AMI. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yes, we're uh, partnering up with AMI um, in this uh, podcast format video. And uh, AMI is one of our big, proud sponsors that we're glad to have on board with us. And in addition to AMI, I'll just reach out to our other sponsors, uh, CNIB Foundation and the Canadian Council of the Blind and all of our Lions Clubs across Canada and last but not least, ISPS Handa. And of course, as we go from tournament to tournament throughout each province, each city, the local volunteers, the businesses, the local sponsorship, any of the sponsors for that matter, we just couldn't do it without them, could we? Absolutely not. And that's why we're here and we're thankful. And uh, especially to uh, the Greens at Renton here in Simcoe, Ontario. You can see behind us uh, this beautiful uh, green lush grass and you can hear the nice pond in behind us and a nice creek there. We might not like that when we're golfing, but uh, we uh, certainly appreciate its beauty right now, right behind us. Oh, it's it's absolutely awesome. A br- nice breeze is blowing. We've got birds, and Darren uh, alluded to uh, to the course and uh, the setting behind us. Um, also, what's new with AMI is the fact that uh, people will notice that we've now gone to a video format as well as our audio format and it'll be a lot easier to access our podcast on YouTube as well as our regular podcast carriers, won't it? Absolutely. So you won't miss a Blind Golf Canada podcast. Well, let's uh, let's jump into this a little bit. As you mentioned, Darren, we are at the Greens of Renton in beautiful, I'll say somewhat historic Simcoe, Ontario. What a lovely setting, and uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to, uh, to be here. But let's back it up for a second, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the Greens at Renton, the Canadian Open, uh, that sort of thing, probably in our next podcast. But blind golf in Canada, why do we do this, Darren, and who are the people that we do it with and do it for? Well, anybody can golf, and um, despite our our disabilities, we have all sorts of ability, and we can still play. And uh, this game is, brings us together. We can still showcase our ability out there, participate with one another recreationally, competitively. It brings us together as a, a, a blind golf family. It sure does, doesn't it? And and. You mentioned something vitally important uh, when you mentioned the the motto of Blind Golf Canada is you can still play and that is in fact true. It doesn't matter if you have never had eyesight before, if you lost your sight as a child, a young adult as I did and you did Darren, a senior, anybody can play this game and if you are listening or viewing now our podcast perhaps for the first time, you are more than welcome to come out. You're not obligated to play tournament golf immediately, 
or any time at all for that matter. We just want you to come out, experience the pleasures and fun of playing blind golf and uh, you come out. We often refer to blind golf in Canada as the biggest peer support group going. And it really is that for the golfers, their guides, their families. It, it really is like a big family out here, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the or uh, can you explain a little bit of how you got into the blind golf? Because there's people today that don't know it exists. And, and how, how did you go get into it? Well, Where did it come about? Uh, I became a blind golfer actually in uh, 1990 when I lost, after I lost my eyesight in 1988. And I was swinging a club and hitting balls at a blind sports symposium. A couple of blind golfers saw me, quote unquote, and uh, word got around and there just happened to be a guide looking for a golfer. We hooked up and here I am 32 years later still doing it. So, uh, I, and what about you? How did you find out about blind golf? I just got introduced to it uh, about 10 years ago um, out in Port Alberni, BC. A gentleman with BC Blind Sports got me involved and uh, I knew nothing about it. And um, it's certainly saved my life. Uh, I golfed my entire life, but my vision was deteriorating and I almost gave it up. And uh, then I was introduced to blind golf and and all you guys out there and I've been carrying on with it for the last 10 years of uh, Blind Golf Canada's existence so uh, it certainly saved my life. I have to say it really did the same for me. Got me up and going again and as I like to say a horrible pun it got me back in the swing of things. <laughs> but Darren for our new listeners and for people that aren't real familiar with Blind Golf what is it exactly and how is it different in terms of playing the game, the rules of golf, things like that? Well, we, um, because of our vision loss, uh, we require coaches, sight coaches. So we rely on them on and off the golf course and um, we work with them, they help us. And uh, so we're out there with them and we have slight modifications to the rules of golf to accommodate us in, in blind golf and in other para golf sports and um, therefore uh, we have s slight modifications but we still follow the same rules that everybody else does out there so hit the same slices the same dock hooks leave the same putt short three putts you three name putts, it yeah. all of the same stuff that sighted golfers do but we do also from time to time hit that long drive sink those long pots and the fun is out there to be had isn't it absolutely no different than any other golfer out there so um, yeah that's why we encourage everybody to come out and play and whether it's recreationally or competitively and co uh, come and join us and and um, there's certainly no age limitations or restrictions or anything like that is there no and we're encouraging uh, youth to come out um, in blind golf and in golf in general we want to see more more youth out here and um, and lady golfers as well yep we need more women golfers we have uh, a few ladies playing but we can certainly see a lot more and we encourage you to come out we welcome everybody out here everybody so Darren uh, you know we won't delve too deeply into where else blind golf is played around the world but it is played internationally but here in Canada, you live out in British Columbia. Uh, one of our fellow golfers, Boyd Stewart, lives out in Nova Scotia. So it really and truly is a nationwide sport and hobby and source of fun for all the blind golfers that want to partake, isn't it? Absolutely. We have uh, golfers from coast to coast and we have a good membership of close to 60 people. and. We want to continue growing that across Canada. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we we have our tournaments uh, across the the country. We have our regions: the Western Canadian Blind Golf Association, the OVIG Provincial Association, or Ontario Visually Impaired Golfers. <coughs> Excuse me, Nova Scotia Blind Golf Association. So uh, yeah, we are, are nationwide, 
We'd like to get a little more into Quebec. We do have some uh, golfers from Quebec here at the tournament this week, and uh, yes. but we're always looking to grow the game anywhere and everywhere that, uh, that we can. So we've talked about who, we've talked about what blind golf is, where we play, and when. Now, being that we are Canadians all across the country, our season is a little bit limited as far as uh, when we can play. Usually spring to late fall, right? Correct, yes. We, uh, <laughs> we don't have the luxury as uh, some other places around the world where we can play year-round or 10 months, so we have a window of five to eight months in Canada to play, depending on where you're, you're located. So Now, uh, people do have the choice, you know, the snowbirds, if you will. There are tournaments in warmer climates, but they too are usually more in the summer months, more so than the, the winter months. It seems everybody almost wants to put down the clubs or play recreational golf in the winter months. And, uh, you know, that, that's okay. We don't have to play competitive golf 12 months of the year. We, we do need a break, but uh, Darren, before we, uh, we skip on out of here, um, we'll talk about in, in a minute, we'll, we'll talk about why we do this and the benefits. Uh, we talked about the benefits before and what it brings to people, but uh, you said that you've been playing for 10 years now. Yep. Okay, so. 10 short years. 10 short <laughs> years, but I'm assuming 10 happy and fulfilling short years absolutely it's been it feels like it's been 50 but uh, 10 great years already experience uh, experiencing a lot of uh, great things coming out of blind golf uh, meeting all the people uh, in my travels in Canada abroad and uh, that's what uh, we all get to to experience that uh, brings us all together and well, uh, memories, so many memories already. So You know what is really crazy? I've been playing competitively for 31 years now and just playing blind golf totally for I think 32 and it seems for me that it's gone by so fast and I think about all the people that I've met, the places that I've been and you know the tournaments that I've been to, the friends that I have made and you know the crazy ironic thing is none of this ever would have happened had i not lost my eyesight you know now i'm not suggesting for a second that people go out and lose their eyesight so you can play golf and join up with us in blind golf but if there's ever a silver lining in a cloud to be had i think blind golf is truly one of those things because i never went anywhere when i could see and I've been halfway around the world multiple times as a blind golfer and I know what it has done for me as a person, how it's enhanced my life and before I recently retired I said that I had to work to pay my golf bills and essentially that's been true for almost you know 30, 31 years. But Who's influenced you or or brought you into the game, uh, who's been our influencer for blind golf from uh, the beginning of Blind Golf Canada? Well, I remember back in those days around 1990, 91, my coach, first coach, became my first coach, Dick Aiken. He was a member of the uh, Saskatoon Lions Club. And the Lions, as you know, Darren, have played a huge role in blind golf over the years uh, throughout Canada. Uh, some of the uh, premier golfers at th that time across the country uh, from down here in Ontario were Claude Padamore, uh, Nick Genovese, who we will be paying tribute to Nick at our wind-up banquet here on Friday night, and uh, moving west. There were more golfers in Ontario as well, but Nick and Claude were fairly prominent back in those days. and they really paved the way in Canada for guys like you and me to be able to play blind golf the way we do. Moving out west, uh, I was very new to the game. 
but there were guys like Otto Huber, Dave Wall, Chuck Kepke, there was uh, John Eli in Manitoba was very prominent. Um, Alberta, there were not many at the time in Alberta and uh, BC was also uh, a little bit lacking back in the early days but fortunately we were able to sustain ourselves to get to the point where we are today and um, you know, before I ever came along, blind golf has been around unofficially since uh, many of the veterans came back from World War II. Veterans that had eye injuries and were totally blinded, and with the help of CNIB, uh, were, were taken out and either resumed the game of golf or were introduced to it. And, you know, some kept playing, some did not, but blind golf, never really went away. Uh, the Western Canadian Blind Golf Association has been in place, I do believe, since the late 1960s, early 70s. The uh, Ontario Blind Golf Association, before it became OVIG, uh, the same, uh, probably in the 70s. Uh, the Ontario Blind Golf Association was in operation. Those were the two main bodies, blind golf bodies in Canada. And as guys like you and me came along, and just um, prior to you joining up, there was a now famous blind golfer from Truro, Nova Scotia, who I'm very happy and proud to call my friend, as do many others, by the name of Brian McLeod. And, um, Brian, with the help of myself and a few others, formed Blind Golf Canada in 2012. So we're celebrating uh, 10 years of the new and current Blind Golf Canada Association. And uh, as you know, tournaments have been around, some of them forever. The Western Canadian moves around between the four Western provinces. OVIG has a series of events that they move around the province of Ontario every summer. And since 19, or sorry, 2022, um, the Canadian Open Championship has been moved around on a three-year cycle all across Canada, starting in the west, going to Ontario, moving out to the Maritimes, and then going back to the west. And as I said, some of the tournaments have been around for a while. Um, the very first Canadian Open was organized and hosted by myself in Saskatoon in 1997. And I'm very happy to say 25 beautiful years of blind golf in Canada later, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary here at the Greens of Renton. So, um, you know, we're getting a little better organized, a little more formal, if you will. Uh, there's still a, a long way to go, but whether it's uh, recreational or competitively or both, I'm so happy to say that blind golf is going strong in Canada. And thanks to you, the viewers and the volunteers, the guides, the coaches, the players, we are only continuing to grow stronger and stronger by the month. I've been to numerous World Blind Golf Championships, uh, including the two here in Canada. The first one was held in Winnipeg in the year 2002, I believe, and uh, it was a fantastic event hosted by Denny McCulloch, a blind golfer and resident of Winnipeg. And uh, also in 2012, uh, the Canadian Open was held in conjunction with the World Blind Golf Championships in Truro, Nova Scotia, hosted, of course, by our late friend Brian McLeod. And uh, that, too, was an absolutely phenomenal event. Um, so I'm happy to say that, you know, the field of golfers that we produce as Canadians, our own members, can compete 
anytime and anywhere with other blind golfers around the world. But in terms of hosting tournaments, Darren, you yourself have hosted a Vision Cup out in British Columbia, as well as numerous Canadian Opens and Westerns and provincial tournaments. So, you know, we really take a backseat to no one else around the world in terms of hosting tournaments. And, um, you know, I think it's almost getting to be time that we took a crack at another big one, like a Vision Cup or a world championships, but uh, that's a conversation we'll save for another podcast. Now, Darren, we know that, you know, blind golf does require the aid of a sight coach or a guide, whatever we want to refer them as. Uh, I knew, I know you being a partially sighted golfer, you utilize your coach or guide a little bit differently than I would mine, but why don't you tell our viewers and listeners just on a typical golf hole, tee box to green, how, what would your coach do for you? Okay, good. that's a good question. My uh, coach, I'm a B3 golfer with about 10% vision, so I uh, rely on my coach to, uh, at this point in time, line up my club head with the ball uh, so it's square and just align me, my shoulders and body, to my target line out in the fairway, and just to kind of uh, describe if there's a, a tree in the background that I could possibly see to, to get my alignment to, the say, the fairway. If it's a dog leg, whether or not I will uh, hit that corner of the dog leg, and um, if I can see that tree or whatever in the background, pick it up, that's my target. And then the same from that shot to the green, um, picking something in behind the green where the flag is. So uh, a lot less work for me versus you, but I, I need them to uh, give me a lot of information as far as uh, alignment. You're still taking it over the corner of dog legs, are you? Yeah, well, depends if I'm hooking or pulling it or pushing it or whatever. So uh, <laughs> depending on the day, the coach has to determine how I'm hitting the ball and uh, and then line me up accordingly. Sometimes yeah, they got to yeah. aim me a little bit more left based on that too. So. And I think <laughs> that would that would go for any coach, given uh, whatever level of sight your golfer has or doesn't have. The golf the the coach has to determine, you know, get an idea how you're playing that day. Are you hitting the ball well? Maybe not so well. Uh, maybe it's going to be a really good day. Uh, perhaps you don't really have it today. So a lot is on the shoulders of, of the coach, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I, I noticed that with our, our B1 golfers, such as yourself, uh, your coach has to do a lot more work, not just where you're, you're hitting the ball, but uh, how he has to uh, take care of you and, and set you up. So we, maybe you can tell the, well, our listeners. And that's something that I, I don't think people, sighted people really understand or appreciate. My coach is helping me, whether we're at a tournament or at home, from the time he picks me up, you know, at my house, guides me to the car, gets me out to the golf course, gets me into the cart, onto the driving range, or the first tee box, whatever it may be. But yeah, you're right, Darren. Chris, my guide, uh, does a lot for me. Let's say we are about to tee off. We'll discuss the yardage on the hole and I know what clubs to pull for certain yardages. And if it's par four or par five, most of the time I'm pulling a driver. So then he has to tee up the ball to the height that I like and prefer and hit it the best at. There's not necessarily any set height uh, requirements or anything like that some guys like it lower some guys like it higher he like you has to align me you know using my legs and or my feet and my shoulders rather in a parallel line going down the free freeway hopefully not the freeway the fairway <laughs> aimed at the flag stick okay now he won't physically manipulate me he'll just tell me open I move a little bit to the left, 
close, maybe a little bit to the right. Okay, good, right there. And he'll say good, I'll say good. He'll back up and say good. And then I swing and hit the ball. And we drive down and do it all over again with the assistance of a GPS of some sort. I use the golf buddy that clips to my hat. It will give us a yardage and we go through the same process all over again. Um, unlike you, I'm no longer able to carry the corner of most dog legs. So we have to play out to the corner and then get that as direct a possible path into the green and, and the pin. But we'll get a yardage, we'll decide what club we're going to hit. And then, as I said, we go repeat the process. He'll set the club down behind the ball. I move into said club while he's holding it steady. And then he'll align my feet and the rest of my body follows as a result. He'll back up and say, okay. I'll give a nod and say, okay. And he says, yeah, and I, I let it go. And hopefully, you know, depending on the length of the hole, it's somewhere on the fairway, the front of the green, if not on the green. And then putting. Uh, putting is, is pretty unique because everybody does it slightly different that I've noticed. What Chris and I do, we will get a distance. Uh, we will both pace it off together. Chris is counting and I'm determining if the slope, if there is any, is going to be uphill or downhill. Maybe there's a slight right to left slope or left to right slope. And we determine all of that. And then Chris is the eyes of the operation. He has to line that putt up so that if I hit it the correct distance and wait, it's going to drop in the hole or be somewhere very close to it. So as you can appreciate listeners, um, it's not a hard job, but it's a very detailed and uh, involved job for the coach or a guide. Would you not agree, Darren? Absolutely. We uh, put our coaches through a lot, and uh, we uh, certainly owe them a lot and appreciate their, their being out there with us. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. So, yeah. Uh, and it uh, sounds like your coach has a lot of work Absolutely. and on his knees a lot and yeah. crouching down. So they, they do a lot for us. And, now, yeah. before we wrap up and get out of here, I want to ask you the question that I get asked a lot. Uh, you played golf before you lost your eyesight. You play it now. Why do you still love the game? What is it about the game of golf that gets you up out of bed every morning and heading for the golf course? I, uh, I love to be outdoors. I love uh, the golf course. It's tranquil and beautiful, but I love the game itself. It's challenging and uh, it challenged me when I had vision. It challenges me now with low vision. I see how it challenges others with no vision and, uh, and I um, appreciate what you, you do when you go out there and play and it inspires me, even with my vision loss, uh, what you guys do out there and I love love that about the game and we can all do it and um, it's uh, great to get together with people out there it's a social game and uh, it just brings us all together and and uh, challenges us and in addition to everything that you've just mentioned there's one thing I need to say that makes me love the game of golf as you know I don't have any sight at all but when I hit a good shot be it with a driver or a wedge or a putter. It feels so good off the face of the club, so much so to the point that you don't even really feel it, do you? No. It, uh, and you hit one or two of those in a round, and you know for sure you're coming back tomorrow to play. Yeah. Aren't you? It brings you back, yeah. You want to keep doing that, and it, it's, uh, it's a great feeling, yeah. And that, everyone, is why we play this wonderful game of blind golf. We hope you'll tune in for the next episode. Thanks so much to AMI and our other sponsors, Darren. And we'll see you next time on the Blind Golf Canada podcast. This has been the Blind Golf Canada podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for tuning in.